some of these uh, channels related to such uh, episodes. Carson Kohler has uh, developed such a model in 2019. There is a prototype GEMS model that we've been using at the agency, developed by the master in 2020. And Albert, Alberto Bota and his authors have also uh, uh, written recently a paper that captures some of these channels as well. So what we wanted to do with this project was we wanted to test whether there is space for monetary policy intervention that can moderate the domestic impact of such uh, appreciation uh, episodes, of such uh, capital inflows induced uh, episodes. And in the literature, the second point is the policy dilemma. And within that relatively amazing literature, there are two extremes. So on the one extreme, we have Woodford et al. Uh, Woodford 2010. No further complications uh, from financial globalization. The policy dilemma is the framework uh, that we, we should be using when analyzing such events. And then on the other extreme, we have Ray 2015, uh, who suggests that the dilemma is essentially a dilemma uh, since monetary policy is actually dictated by the economic norm, by the USA. And then uh, there is a middle ground uh, expressed by Oster the Tal 2015. Uh, the DIS people, the economists, and the Bank for uh, International Sentiments, uh, where they suggest that monetary policy may need to deviate from any targets, uh, inflation, unemployment rates, exchange rate, or financial fragility targets. And there are trade offs between standard macro objectives and other targets, but we can come up with monetary policies that meet all targets in a way that is most stabilized. And I take this expression almost verbatim from Oster because Essentially, they admit that the standard Taylor rules, the standard activist monetary policies, do not seem to work uh, particularly well for developing economies. And there is a very nice survey that I forgot to cite here by the BIS, where uh, they ask central bankers in developing economies whether they follow uh, Taylor rule type of policies, and they admit that they do not follow such policies, which, from coming from a post Keynesian perspective, I find very um, Interesting. So, what I wanted to do here in this exercise was to actually contrast new Wixilian with post Keynesian views on the interest rate and the, the role of monetary policy. So, what I will be uh, presenting is, is the following. Um, or maybe I can say this here and then I will move on. I will be comparing Taylor rules and Taylor rule variants with post Keynesian uh, uh, part to its approach monetary policies combined with FX intervention, public intervention in the FX market, and sterilization policies. So, what do we do in this paper? We extend the GEMS prototype SFC model for small global economies developed by Limas and Um, uh, The reason we do this is because this model captures all the major channels associated with the transmission mechanisms of capital flows. So, we have all these balance sheet effects that uh, uh, SFC models are very good at capturing. Uh, we rely on, on the Belfield School of Macrodynamics uh, with respect to how we model the actual economy. So uh, we pay um, particular attention to market disequilibria and uh, with heterogeneous adjust adjustment speeds. And we do these things in a nonlinear continuous dynamics framework. We rely on, a lot on system dynamics. Um, for instance, the model has like 37 uh, state variables, 37 dimensions, which is not necessarily an advantage, but um, it's gives an idea of how uh, detailed we want to be when it comes to the dynamics of, of such economies. And as I already said, we use such a framework in, the, in order to model the capacity of small open economies uh, to moderate the global financial monetary forces through monetary, monetary policy. And I will be focusing on tailored rule variants and the fascinating index class competing intervention and stabilization. Um, at, the, at the moment, the focus is on the short run. So we do not pay attention in the long run right now. Uh, this is something that we want to, to do in the future. So at the moment, we focus exclusively on uh, how to dampen the appreciation induced boom bust uh, cycles and to reduce the effects and impact of volatility while the economy still converges to a relatively exogenous uh, balance of payments constraint factors. So what are the ingredients of this model? Um, the smaller is a smaller economy. We have uh, firms, households, banks, central bank, the government, and the rest of the world. And there are four main blocks in the model uh, related to capital flows and effects dynamics, interest rate dynamics, monetary policy, price dynamics, wages, and employment, 
and the current account of productivity dynamics. Uh, I will not be showing you, uh, showing you any equations. I'll just let you explain in words what's going on inside the model. Um, so I'll start with, with firms. There is this equilibrium in the goods market uh, with both price and quantity adjustments. Uh, firms form adaptive expectations on expected sales. They have a desired inventory ratio, and then investment is based on expected profitability and desired inventories. Imports uh, in real terms depend on uh, different time varying import propensities out of real levels of uh, demand, of all demand components. Um, and these uh, propensities, the uh, import pro propensities, are negative functions of import taxes and the real exchange rates. Export depends on, on the growth rate of, of the rest of the world. Uh, exports, again, uh, are negative uh, time varying function of export taxes, positive function of the exchange rates. Prices are set as a markup of uh, historical unit costs, which are a function of labor costs and import costs, essentially. And the market is a negative function of the divergence between actual and desired inventory uh, ratio. Firms finance a proportion of investment through FX borrowing, and we also call the FX deposits uh, for precautionary reasons. And the desired FX borrowing depends on expected arbitrage opportunities between domestic lending and uh, uh, domestic FX rates. And of course, a part of the profits are distributed back uh, to partners. Now, the banking sector. Banks purchase a percentage of government bonds uh, based on certain regulations and the, the relative magnitudes of uh, the interest rates on bonds and the domestic lending rates. They uh, act as FX loan intermediaries between firms and foreign funds. So if a domestic firm wants to loan in FX, the, the firm will need to get a loan from the bank in the model. Um, there is a FX quantity rationing. Um, so the gross, the cross border lending supply depends on the uh, rest of the world's GDP, the interest rate spread, and the country risk. Um, and there is also price rationing. So the, the FX interest rates are just based on, uh, on excess demand and supply of uh, cross border lending. The banks will charge a time variety premium over the, this rate to firms, and this premium uh, depends on the first uh, uh, debt uh, to expected profits ratio. So we have like a mean scan favor, the financial accelerator effect. Um, banks are subject to note and position, and there are no portfolio holdings of foreign assets. Um, the retained earnings, uh, banks retain earnings in order to satisfy a certain uh, capital adequacy ratio, and then they distribute the rest of households. And they, say, they apply the same premium to domestic lending rates as well. Um, and then deposit rates are also endogenous, they depend on the policy rate and the markdown that is a function of the liquidity needs of the bank. So, if banks need more liquidity, they will try to attract cheap liquidity by raising the deposit rate. The government sector is fairly simple. It spends a constant share of uh, nominal production plus kind of cyclical components. It taxes wages, profits, and imports. It issues bonds to finance the deficit, and the bonds rate is a markup over inflation, which depends on public debt to GDP ratio. Moving on to the labor market and how households behave, we have a long TX type employment determination, so zero substitution between labor and capital. At the moment, uh, productivity growth is exogenous. We intend to endogenize it when we will try to focus on long-term dynamics. Um, nominal wages are set through a wage bargaining process a la Goodwin. So we have like this um, real wage Phillips care with some money usually on top of that. Uh, households receive income through wages, dividends, uh, benefits, and remittance fees. They have a target consumption. Uh, different target consumptions have a different uh, income uh, and financial wealth with time varying propensities to consume. And these propensities to consume uh, depend on the real deposit rate. And then actual consumption slowly adjusts to, to these targets in order to capture the uh, high information. And then, of course, households allocate savings between bonds or uh, deposits based on relative interest rates. Um, the amount of foreign finance flows that enter the country depends on the arbitrage opportunities we can expect in foreign yield and domestic yield. Uh, with, uh, with factors uh, in uh, this kind of expected exchange rate movements and the country risk, which is a function of the net international investment position of the country and an exogenous rate comparison component. There is a constant equilibrium in the exchange uh, markets. We have a nominal exchange rate that increases and decreases with uh, 
uh, excess FX demand or supply. FX demand is given by imports, the income, uh, the income account and the new FX reserves, and the FX supply is given by excess uh, foreign FX flows, the new FX debt minus the change in uh, the FX reserves at the central bank. And the expected exchange rate is follows this forward passing premium, which is an implicit forward looking component in the uh, behavior of international investors and also backward looking adjustments. So the, the expectations do not diverge uh, um, permanently from what is actually going on. And this is, I will show you some equations because I want to focus on the behavior of the central bank since, since this is the main exercise that we focus here. The central bank uh, determines the monetary policy. So in the prototype GEMS model, there is a pure inflation targeting rule. So the central bank, uh, the central bank acts as in the divine consequence for, uh, following the Blanchard and Galli uh, um, definition with a tail of risk, of course, that uh, falls. So what I do here is I extend this, this by introducing different um, policy rules. So we have a standard tail rule that's also uh, incorporate, incorporates the uh, unemployment gap, which works as a proxy for output gap. And then we have an open economy tailor rule, which extends the standard tailor rule with um, an element that depends on the deviations of the exchange rate from the target. And then we have a hybrid fascinating index, which is a, the simplest in the index that we could think of, uh, which is simply the trends, the exogenous trend growth of labor productivity plus inflation. These are all actual uh, values rather than expected variables. Um, there is no interest rate smoothing and policy inertia at the moment, so monetary policy adjusts a bit, a bit volume if you want, compared to, to the real life that this is just a simplified assumption. Um, and what, I, what else the central bank does? It acts as a lender of last resort, so it absorbs the excess supply of government bonds, and then uh, crucially, it intervenes in the FX market. So here we follow the IMF recommendation, which is like three times of annual imports or something as, as FX holdings, plus an intervention uh, that is there to prevent the FX speculation. And we activate this only in the case of the fascinating index. So normally the central bank, of course, uh, does intervene to have some FX holdings, but uh, it intervenes in order to prevent FX speculation only in the scenario where the uh, fascinating index, the fair rate in the, uh, the fair rate rule is introduced. And then it sterilizes this intervention through uh, central bank securities. Uh, in the simulations, uh, the sterilization is full. Uh, and then this sterilization, of course, of course, feeds back into the bank's total financing needs, which are financed through uh, advances from the central bank. Um, so this is. <laughs> The main channels through which um, uh, the boom uh, operates in the model. I kind of explained you already how this works, but just to uh, wrap it up, we have three main channels. So we have the trade channel, uh, so appreciation, or the what I will show you here is some simulations where the, uh, the real, uh, the world interest rate falls. We see how the economy uh, reacts to such to such a fall because. There will be a tendency for investors to invest in the country to uh, exploit the arbitrage opportunities. So, on the one hand, we have the trade channel, so things that operate through the trade balance, and then we have the balancing channel, which captures the asset price, uh, asset price dynamics. Uh, you have the effects liabilities channel, which operates through the accelerator, through the Minskian effect, and then we have real balances. So we look also on, on what is going on in respect to the real income. And then, of course, we have a liquidity channel. Uh, since um, uh, monetary policy will affect interest rates, and this will affect liquidity conditions in the country. And this is how the bust operates. So when the, the boom ends, uh, this is how the uh, economy will uh, uh, will have to go through the adjustment, which I will I will go through in more detail during the scenarios. So. How much time do I have? Yeah, and it's perfect. So I will present uh, four scenarios if you want. No, 15 minutes. Thanks. Excellent. So there is a baseline scenario, uh, which is uh, taken from the uh, GEMS prototype model uh, developed by uh, my good colleagues. Um, in this baseline scenario, we have capital inflows plus pure inflation targeting. 
And of course, the main shock, the only shock that we do at the moment is a negative shock to the world interest rates. And then I introduced consequently uh, three scenarios. There is one scenario with capital inflows combined with a standard Taylor rule. So it's the baseline plus the augmented Taylor rule. The second scenario will be capital inflows with a augmented Taylor rule that accounts for developments in the uh, uh, exchange um, um, markets. And the third scenario will be the Passinetti index plus quantity intervention in stabilization. And then I've been working on two more scenarios that I haven't had the chance to do things yet. Uh, one scenario focuses on the long run, so we want to endogenize productivity and structural change to, to look at the long run consequences of such boom bust episodes. Because, of course, these boom bust episodes are associated with high services effects. The productive sector usually is destroyed during the appreciation. And, of course, the economy after the uh, adjustment, it's, it's, it may return to a, to a path that is below the initial path. And then on the last scenario, we want to introduce some uh, capital control, which is, um, uh, as I will uh, maybe explain later on, I find it's a relatively difficult task, uh, both conceptually and technically. Um, but for the moment, I will just focus on the on the blue scenarios. So this is how the baseline scenario works. This is how the transmission channels play out on the model. The world interest rate drops. This creates arbitrage opportunities for investors um, um, enter enter the, the country, uh, VFX reserves uh, relative to GDP initial increase. We have a real appreciation captured by the real exchange uh, dynamic. Uh, we have a fall of inflation because the cost of imports goes down. Uh, this generates a boom, an economic boom. This generates a trade deficit. Uh, initially, the long to deposit rate spread falls. Um, you have this boom, so the interest rate falls, the uh, marginal propensity to consume increases, consumption goes up, expected profitability goes up, initially public debt and GDP falls because the economy does better, so you have more taxes, uh, lower um, counter cyclical expenses, but this, of course, gradually builds up the country risk, and when the country risk peaks, then the bust uh, happens and the whole situation uh, reverses. Um, and of course, if you want to look at some parametric plots here, I have unemployment in the real exchange rate, so you get this uh, boom and bust episode quite clearly. Uh, and I focus here on unemployment and the real exchange rate, the public debt and GDP and the exchange rates, uh, unemployment, the current account, and then um, unemployment and inflation. So you have this uh, boom and bust episode quite clearly uh, picture in these parametric plots. And then in the first scenario, as I already explained, I introduced the Taylor Rule, Standard Mainstream Monetary Policy. And here I present some sensitivity scenarios uh, with respect to how much the central bank focuses on the unemployment gap. Um, so what is going on here is we, we still have the boom, right? So we still have this uh, arbitrage window that opens. Uh, and then what, what is going on through the boom, the unemployment goes below the, the target of the central bank. So the central bank increases the interest rate. So this increase in the interest rates uh, uh, tends to suppress, if you want, the, um, the boom in the sense that it has two effects. It has a, an adverse distributional effect because it shifts uh, income distribution towards profits and profit earners who have a lower propensity to consume. But it also has a debt burden effect, like a means effect. So higher interest rates uh, leads to higher debt burden, which tends to reduce the amplitude of the domestic economy. Boom. It does nothing for the uh, for the boom boom bust episode per se, because it cannot prevent the appreciation and depreciation cycle. It just dampens the domestic impact by uh, uh, through these uh, two adverse effects: the income distribution effect and the uh, uh, that burden effect. Um, and um, maybe I could show you this um, more clearly here. So the more we increase Yota 2, the more we increase the sensitivity of the central bank mitigations of the unemployment rate from the target rate, the, the, the more vertical the parametric plots regarding the current account balance and the employment uh, account. So it that doesn't allow unemployment to go through very high levels and then very low levels. It initially generates a recessionary effect in the economy to dampen 
uh, this employment cycle. Um, second scenario that we focus, we augment the standard Taylor rule with a component that depends on deviations of the exchange rate, the real exchange rate from the targets. And here again, I show you how uh, uh, the economy behaves for different for different values of delta three as a sensitivity exercise. And here, the situation is partly reversed. Again, the central bank does nothing about the boom bust episode per se. It does nothing to um, prevent the initial uh, boom. But what it does, uh, it very quickly reduces the interest rate because it's very sensitive to uh, the deviations of the real exchange rate from the initial target. And by reducing the interest rate, as you see, we move from, for instance, from red to uh, blue and then perfect, and what you see is that you generate an even higher boom domestic, right? So even after the appreciation, if the falling data interest rate is too high, even, even initially you have an inflationary rate. Despite the fact that imports are now cheaper and unit costs should prevent this. Um, and of course, if you generate a higher boom, you have higher current account deficit initially, and then more violent adjustment afterwards. Uh, you have a rapid, uh, uh, the economy runs out of FXSS much faster compared to the case where the sensitivity is lower. And um, um, again, if, if you want to see what is going on with respect to real exchange rate and unemployment, now the, the dynamics are flat. Okay. So it's, it pays less attention to unemployment dynamics and much more attention to the real exchange rate. Uh, so the, the boom bust episode is associated with, with less appreciation and depreciation, but domestically, you still have this boom bust um, And then in the third scenario, this is, I suppose, the, the main message of this, of this exercise. Here we combine the fair rate rule, the Bassinet index, with um, intervention in the, uh, in the FX market. So now the, Interest rate policy is, is passive. The central bank parks the real interest rate at the, at the long run uh, trend of level productivity, and it tries to dampen the dynamics of the boom bust episode through FX interventions. And here I repeat the equation that uh, explains this intervention, and what I do, I present some sensitivity analysis with respect to your attempt, right? So, it looks at the boom bust episode. It looks at the at the appreciation of the of the exchange rate, and when the interest rate tends to appreciate, it uh, intervenes. And the more okay, so effectively, what what we see here is that since the central bank intervenes. The real exchange rate that tends to not appreciate that much. Okay? The higher the intervention, the less is the appreciation because the central bank cuts the appreciation episode at, at its beginning. But at the same time, since the interest rate does not adjust, yes, thanks. Since the interest rate does not adjust, the only force that will bring down the arbitrage uh, opportunity is the gradual fall of inflation. So we have, even though the boom last episode is partly or fully cancelled at the beginning, the higher intervention, the less the appreciation. At the same time, the arbitrage opportunity, the arbitrage window is prolonged. Um, so maybe if I could show you this. Yeah. I guess it's not very helpful, but <laughs> I guess the, the main message here is that the FX intervention on the one hand prevents the boom in the past episode, but then again, this is combined with a, with a parking unit approach with respect to the interest rate. So the interest rate does not adjust to the, to the development, to the world, uh, uh, to the fall of the world interest rate, which tends to prolong the arbitrage of security. So you tend to have a, a more prolonged boom bust episode, even though the magnitude of the episode per se is, is uh, dominant. Uh, so just to sum up some of the conclusions, when we look at the standard Taylor rule, the standard Taylor rule has adverse distributional and debt burden effects uh, during the appreciation since the interest rate goes up, which tends to lower the multiplier and lead to lower 
uh, and jobless domestic boom. But at the same time, since the interest rate goes up, it prolongs the arbitrage, which tends to amplify the boom bust and to increase the country risk in the long run. And of course, since the episode is, is prolonged, um, uh, this leads to a severe depreciation and higher inflation in the long run. If we look at the open economy in the room, then we have a partly reverse situation where there is a rapid fall in the policy rate, which leads to lower arbitrage opportunities, but also to a, to a domestic boom, higher domestic boom due to the low, low interest rate environments. Uh, and due to positive distributional effects, since more income goes to um, uh, wage earners, which tend to have higher capacity. Um, so, the economic boom has high imports and less appreciation, which is inflation, but also the fast adjustment to the FX market because the arbitrage opportunity uh, flows faster. And this is would partly agree with the raised dilemma hypothesis, right? So, if, if you look at the developments in your exchange rate, if the US reduces the interest rates, the open economy will have to do the same thing. And if it operates under such, such a rules. And lastly, I uh, discussed the fascinating rule plus quantity effects of the version of serialization. And I argue that this effectively cuts the boom bust episode by reducing the supply effects uh, reserves. And it cuts all the transmission channels at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, of course, this is this is how the interest rate works. But since the interest rate is less expensive, but the real interest rate is, is actually fixed, uh, this makes it distributionally this is makes it distributionally neutral. But at the same time, it increases the the length of the episode due, due to the sustained of uh, arbitrage opportunities. Um, and since this is very much a work in progress, uh, these are the next steps. This is where I intend to go with this one. Um, we wanted to test some intervention, more intervention rules that account for financial stability, and uh, maybe play a little bit with how the central bank stabilizes the intervention. We want to introduce macro potential policies because this is considered an, an important toolkit nowadays. So we want to see uh, whether the central bank can mitigate the financial and fragility effects through other cyclical capital buffers and liquidity uh, buffers in line with the Basel III. And I also want to uh, incorporate capital controls, but as I said, this is a hard task, both conceptually and technically. Uh, but there are some examples, real world examples, maybe some withholding tax on short term investors. So we may, we may have to kind of differentiate investors into speculators and long term investors and see how we can introduce capital controls so that we, we, so that we can control at least this, this part of the uh, um, speculated boom bust episode. Um, these are the references that they use and uh, they are just like, I think,